European Institute of the Mediterranean and also on behalf of eBay and the Master of International Relations and Security and International Relations and Security, which is the master that is organizing this session of the program. We would like to thank you for having accepted our invitation to come. And especially, we would like to thank Dr. Do uh, Dr. Dunia Mahluli for having accepted our invitation to come and to share her ideas with us today this evening. I think we, we have today a very suggesting, a very, a very interesting and a very, uh, I would say, um, curious topic, okay? Because we are going to deal with jihadism and information warfare beyond the, the, the age. And I think we have the best person to do it. Uh, Dr. Mahluli, uh, she made her thesis, uh, her PhD thesis on information and narratives and communication of, of ISIS through social media and through internet. So I think she's very, very, very uh, up to date in how uh, these sort of organizations communicate. And our main idea is to, now that all media are informing about the so-called end of uh, ISIS in the territory, the idea is, is that the end of everything? Uh, how are, are we going to fight the idea of jihadism beyond this military uh, interventions and these military uh, responses? How can we combat this idea, and particularly how can we combat uh, the narratives of this uh, kind of organizations. So with all these questions, uh, I will leave the floor to Dr. Mahlou Mahlouli. Uh, she will explain us her ideas on the topic, and then we will have uh, the chance afterwards to have a Q&A session, and so you can make your own questions and you can make your comments. Okay, the session will be in English, and afterwards also the Q&A in English. If there is anyone who is not mm, willing to intervene in English, we can do the translation for him or her, okay? So no problem. Uh, so, Dr. Mahluli, you've got the floor. Yes, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, speak today. I'm very flattered to uh, you know, be offered the chance to interact with you. Um, so I just want to clarify that my PhD was actually not specifically on ISIS. It's actually um, um, as I started my postdoc career that I was looking at, uh, invited to look at um, ISIS p propaganda more specifically. But before that, um, as a PhD student, I actually looked at how uh, the leading political groups competing for power in the post-revolutionary phase in Tunisia, in Egypt, apply social media in their own campaigning you know, as part of their own campaigning strategy. So in a way, I'm very much interested in how the you know, official uh, political institutions in the Arab world are using different techniques to communicate, you know, whether it is you know, like state propaganda, the mainstream media, or social media um, you know, as a more innovative form of communication. Um, aside from you know, activism and you know, like social media activism, you know, as it started, um, before the you know uh, years let, ten years let's say before the rise of, of uh, you know before the, the um, uprisings in in 2011, so um, I, I will address that more specifically in the in the context of uh, this lecture. But um, please feel free to um, ask any question at some point because I've been told that you uh, don't uh, have um, I mean not all of you at least have a, a background in Middle Eastern studies. So if there's anything that is a bit too specific. Please do let me know. So for today's lecture, I'd like to um, introduce the concept of virtual jihad. This is a concept that one of my colleagues at ICSR, Charlie Winter, came up with. Um, it's basically a concept that helps understanding how um, ISIS operates in terms of its propaganda and how it has been applying social media um, you know, like since uh, 2013 and how he, it has evolved and whether or not it's going to play a role in the process through which it might survive as an ideology after being defeated uh, territorially. So um, I'm going to address this question and I'm gonna look at specific examples um, uh, in relation to a study that we're currently doing at ICSR. Uh, we're currently conducting a compar comparison of two um, media uh, outlets of ISIS. Um, one propaganda magazine that is targeted for a transnational audience in different languages, and one um, newspaper that, that is actually uh, being released, that has been released on, um, in the ISIS uh, occupied territory. So I'm going to look at this and try to exemplify some of the um, uh, facts 
uh, that I will uh, comment on uh, relating to ISIS propaganda. Um, after that, I'm going to look at um, how online activities, activism, and more specifically the narrative surrounding the idea of online activism, has shifted in, uh, in, the, um, in the way that you know, like uh, we think about it in relation to the MENA region, you know, the Middle East. Um, and also, uh, I'm going to try and invite you to think about information warfare uh, from a broader spectrum, not specifically when it comes to ISIS and you know, like insurgency and activism, but also in relation to you know, like how you know, official agencies such as you know, like private media and the state actually use some form of you know, like specifically you know, whether it's biased or you know, uh, somehow driven or interested, oriented, some form of uh, narratives that is meant to position themselves also in relation to the issue of radicalization and in relation to the way they also position themselves in the you know, uh, new political landscape of the Middle East. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, this, was, this should bring me to actually um, uh, formulate an argument that we might enter a new phase in the history of you know, like how we want to address the issue of radicalization, but also how we want to you know, like reflect and in a critical way about this concept. So, um, yeah, I'll begin. <laughs> so what is, virtual uh, what is the virtual caliphate and what is virtual jihad? So this is an idea that has been conceptualized by different experts uh, over the last uh, uh, years. Uh, more specifically with the rise of uh, ISIS as a prominent uh, actor um, uh, in, the, in, in Iraq and uh, Syria. Um, and it ac actually basically relates to this new form of propaganda, the way that you know, like ISIS has been um, incorporating social media um, you know, uh, in, in, as a, you know, like in a very different way uh, to what basically Al Qaeda has um, used to function, you know, like in terms of how they would portray themselves in the media or seek media attention. Uh, attention, basically, uh, this idea of virtual uh, caliphate or virtual jihad has to do with, you know, incorporating so social media to develop a new form of recruitment strategy to access, you know, like, um, you know, uh, promote themselves, recruit foreign fighters. Uh, try to call supporters to conduct lone wolf attacks and so on. So this has been prominently and extensively commented on the media and uh, uh, mainstream media, I mean, and I'm pretty sure that you heard about this phenomenon. Um, but there's also, there has been like different theories around this and how to explain it, you know, like, of course, so it's a very, it's a little less jihad. Some of these people, the people that actually, you know, lone wolf actors or people that actually uh, uh, come to embrace this ideology through this form of virtual jihad are actually not that much ideologically uh, engaged, potentially not <coughs> as ideologically engaged as they used to be you know, uh, in the uh, former Al-Qaeda framework. So what does it mean? And obviously there are different uh, theories, competing theories sometimes. You might have heard of the theory of Olivier Roy as opposed to that of Gilles Kepel, for instance, in France. Uh, you know, Whereas Gilles Kepard would say that somehow political Islam has to do with this phenomenon and it's playing a part in this phenomenon, uh, Olivier Roy is more critical of that and says that somehow you know, this form of radicalization doesn't have anything to do with Islam, that it's just a form of nihilism in, or, you know, in, in today's new generation, and that Islam is, o is only the vehicle of this phenomenon. But we can address that more specifically in the Q&A session. So, um, so uh, I think one of the most interesting, one of the very interesting aspect of this um, uh, virtual jihad is also that somehow it also emphasizes some of the main, um, some argument of, of a global jihad. Uh, one of them, which is, you know, we don't want to, we deny any form of political debate. You know, we condemn election, we condemn participative election, we condemn pluralism, because it's against the principle of tawhid, which is the unicity of God. So if there's one God, there should be one Ummah, there should be one Islamic society, um, and there shouldn't be any deliberative process because there's no form of pluralism because we are one and we are only guided by God. So that's somehow the narrative. And this is also the way, you know, like these organizations, well, you know, these jihadi organizations tend to oppose themselves to uh, democracy and condemn democracy in different kind of ways. Uh, but it's also somehow, this also contributes to, um, 
I want to say, um, you know, just keep the discourse, the ideology very um, uh, utopian. You know, somehow it's, a, it's not about how we're going to actually implement a caliphate. It's not very much about that. It's about how we're going to dream together about the establishment of a caliphate, which, we, you know, maintains this idea very much virtual. And that's also the reason why it should be conceptualized as a virtual caliphate. Not only because it's using social media and because people interact using, you know, like, you know, through virtual interaction. It's not only because of that. It's also because... You know, it's this entire, this utopia that remains very virtual. So people just, they hope for the establishment of the caliphate, but they somehow know that, you know, it's not about how we're actually going to implement it. And through this, it becomes very easy to actually just seek for, you know, like, you know, jihad or death, because in itself, jihad and death, is also a form of Ethiopia. This is something that also comes through, you know, like the work of Olivier Roy, if he actually reads through his theory, and if you're interested in this aspect of uh, research on jihad, that it, it, this is a, um, you know, he's, you should really read his book. This is a very interesting book. So in order to basically look at how this, um, you know, like virtual caliphate also works, I'm going to compare, I'm just going to show you a couple of, you know, like just a few examples from, extracted from some of uh, the propagandist material they disseminate. So this is from one of their uh, newspaper, Naba, which is disseminated, has been uh, actually printed um, and disseminated offline in their territories. It's also circulating online, obviously. But this is much more kind of formatted as a newspaper. And it's about basically how ISS is conducted opera conducting operations uh, in the territory. And it has more of a military vocabulary. It's about, you know, like, okay, we're going to, you know, we are the army of the caliphate. So we are a proper army. We are a proper state. You know, and we're sending our troops, you know, to fight, you know, like, uh, you know, they call it the Nusayde army, which is, you know, like, um, Assad army. We are, you know, like, conduct conducting this operation against, you know, like, military, uh, specifically military targets and so on. And they do emphasize military targets and so on. And this some, somehow contrasts with the type of propaganda that they disseminate, um, you know, in foreign, in, you know, in, you know, in a, abroad. So in other in, um, foreign languages, and also, you know, like in Europe and so on. So, in order to illustrate this, I'll show you. So this is um, this is a design that is extracted from Rumeya, which is one of their uh, propaganda magazines that is disseminated in eight languages exclusively online. Um, and it's like it tends to have more of um, kind of uh, focus on, um, you know, lone wolf terrorist attacks. So for instance, it has a section on how to conduct operations, you know, like what kind of, um, opera uh, um, you know, like terror tactics could be useful if you want to conduct a lone wolf operations and so on. And it has more <laughs> ideological pieces. It's more about, you know, like cultivating this idea, this virtual kind of, you know, like utopia of the f caliphate rather than, you know, like how we actually going to operate, uh, you know, in terms of conducting an operations, you know, like actually fighting on the ground. So it has less of a military emphasis as the media that is actually disseminated on the ground. So the reason why I'm actually showing you this is because they are very careful at the way, you know, there's a very cl somehow clever strategy that comes with, you know, like we, we want to establish ourselves you know, like in this part of the world, this way, we want to, you know, like use ideology to, you know, like somehow uh, target this type of recruits, you know, like this other way and so on. Now, um, uh, so for instance, in order to summarize some of the things that I just said, I just want to say, so there's this distinction between, you know, like conducting, uh, spreading propaganda in different languages. So as I said, with Romania, for instance, you know, you find, you know, like the magazine disseminated in Turkish, German, English, French, so on. Each of these different issues, for instance, in the different languages has exclusive content. So for instance, if you look at the magazines that are disseminated in Germany, they would have an exclusive article on how to kill on the fact that as a supporter of Daesh, you are somehow allowed to kill Catholic priests. So, um, so, so, so there's, there's, there's a there's somehow quite, um, in a way, um, targeted for also specific audiences. 
Um, so as I said, so the, the, for instance, when it comes to Naba, you know, like the, the Arabic uh, language uh, form of propaganda, you find news reports that are primarily, uh, primarily uh, covering, you know, like um, the primary territory of the Islamic states as they actually, um, as they present them. So this would be like primarily Iraq, Syria, Libya, and Sinai. Um, and you also have a few, obviously, um, news stories or news reports about um, what's happening, ha happening around the world, but it's mostly, um, you know, like with a focus, a regional focus. Um, and it also, it also explains why somehow, you know, the people that happen to be recruits of ISIS in the occupied, ter in the territories that uh, would have been occupied by ISIS and some of them which are still occupied by ISIS, why they tend to fall into this ideology. And it also distresses the fact that, you know, like the reason why these people fall into ISIS ideology is also different from the reasons why, obviously, recruits here in Europe would buy into ISIS ideology. That's only an example of, you know, like the type of uh, geographic, so the, the locations that tend to be extensively covered in the, the ISIS news report, the ones in Naba, which is regional, with a regional focus, are mostly, as you can see, in the Levant region. Whereas when it comes to Rumeya, there's more of a, you know, like, you know, larger focus. You know, it's about, okay, the caliphate is this big thing. And, you know, like, if you are in the Philippines and you're supportive of the caliphate, somehow you belong to the same community as this other guy in the US who's a supporter of the caliphate. It's, it basically, it builds this idea that these people are part of this caliphate of the mind, basically. They all dream about the same thing, which is, in fact, not the same thing, but they all think that it's the same thing. So um, now, of course, in order to really briefly also just emphasize the fact that, so as you know, um, ISIS uh, since uh, 2016, 2015, 2016, um, has also, so we've n witnessed um, significant territorial decline of the organization, has lost 62% of the territory that it initially claimed in 2014. Uh, um, so that 62% is actually in Iraq with 30% in Syria. Um, the um, spokesman of the organization, Al-Adnani, was killed in August uh, uh, 2016. And uh, also, of, of course, you know that the organization was defeated in Sirte, Mosul, and Raqqa. And um, our experts also show that they, they argue that there's also uh, the estimates of the revenues of the organization have also dropped. And we also see that there's been a shift of narrative. So I, I don't know if some of you know that, but you know, as part of the ideology, one of the ways that, you know, like ISIS really like framed its message and its cause was that, you know, like there was this idea that there was this eschatological tradition that there was gonna be a battle in in the Syrian city of Darbaq, and that after the uh, after the the Islamic State, so-called Islamic State, would have uh, succeeded in this um, battle, this would have been the end of the world. Okay, and after you know, like ISIS would have been somehow rewarded in heaven, um, and so uh, um, of course, so so uh, ISIS uh, came to reach Darbaq, but lost Darbaq after the. Um, uh, you know, like st um, after the um, uh, 26 after 2016, the shift surrounding the Battle of Dabek actually entirely switched, uh, shifted. Uh, sorry, the the narrative shifted entirely, as um, ISIS framed it. And what happened was that you know, like the Battle of Dabek, according to ISIS propaganda, suddenly became the epic of Dabek, and there was this entire argument that, you know, somehow. Uh, a real, you know, like jihadi supporter would have had, you know, needed to become, you know, like steadfast and patient, and that actually, you know, the battle of Dabak as they initially pictured it was going to potentially last for years. So, um, so you can see also how the narrative uh, progressively uh, can progressively uh, progressively be adapted. Um, so in relation to this territorial decline, there, there's also been a significant media decline of the organization. So um, this actually just shows you an overview. I'm sorry, I should have, should have been bigger. But um, this can be found. This actually has been produced by my colleague, ICSR colleague, uh, Charlie Winter. And it's actually an overview of all the different media outlets 
uh, produced by Dabert, and uh, you know, uh, you can see that actually 10 percent. Um, this this is the ov um, the overview of what of what was produced uh, in 2015, and now um, from all the media outlets that were produced in 2015, there's only 10 percent of the different media pieces that ISIS has produced as part of its propaganda that still exist. Um, so. Apart from that, ISIS has been also warning its supporters that they shouldn't be using mobile data because they are also very uh, um, um, conscious about surveillance, online surveillance, and, and so on. There has been a successful policy censorship implemented by tech companies. So it's also, we should know that although policymakers kept raising awareness about online propaganda, you know, Policymakers, civil society members have also been successful at, you know, somehow reducing the propaganda that, you know, that the mainstream social media users might be exposed to. Um, now, however, experts are also anticipating the fact that due to its territorial decline, ISIS might also, you know, like put an emphasis on online media again. And for instance, you know, like they released a media operative manifesto in 2017, saying that they wanted to focus on the media again, that media jihad was as important as territorial jihad. Uh, they've been draw, uh, drawing attention on other uh, zones, potential zones of conflicts and insurgencies such as Sinai, uh, you know, like the Philippines, you know, uh, uh, Chechnya and so on. So, so it's also important to see and anticipate, foresee the, the possibility that virtual, you know, the virtual uh, jihad, so to speak, might also be an opportunity for this organization to, to remain sustainable or to reemerge in another form. Now, based on what I've just explained, I would like to now switch to, uh, I'd like to now to invite you to think differently about this idea of propaganda and information warfare. Because as the public debate has been addressing this issue recently, there's been very much a focus on, you know, insurgency propaganda, you know, terrorist groups, you know, Daesh, you know, Jabhat Nusra, and so on. But if you actually remember what was said in 2011, so shortly after the uprisings about social media, you know, there was this idea that social media could bring some form of democratization, you know, like, wow, there has been the uprisings, pro-revolutionaries are using Twitter, it's a Twitter revolution. You know, like social media is playing such an important role among the youth, you know, potentially this is the way for the youth to find freedom of expression, debate, you know, like experience pluralism, and so on. This was a common assumption in 2011. Progressively, we've seen that, you know, like now, the way that people have been debating in, in about, you know, like this issue, is more in the sense of, wow, social media, does it bring pluralism? Pop sorry, pop populism. Does it, you know, is it a trigger for, you know, like the far right? Is it a trigger for, you know, like the more, you know, like more, you know, jihad, jihadi group and so on? So this kind of this, you know, like, and, and this, this is a debate that is currently ongoing. It has been the case in the UK, you know, like with Sereza May also, um, condemning tech companies recently, whereas, you know, the whole debate of tech companies and censorship on social media has been going on for almost five years now, no, let's say uh, three to four years. But, um, but really, the, the entire narrative around social media has shifted. Now, around this, there's also this idea that, you know, like, if we were to explain what participative democracy is, you look at, you know, like the soci sociology of the media, Recently, if you look at what scholars had uh, written in cultural studies, so media studies, they look at social media and they say, no, social media, it's a different form of, you know, like, exp you know, like uh, uh, it leads to different form of social movements. It's fluid narratives, people personalize the message. You, you know, you post a hashtag, people interpret it in different ways. It brings together people from different, you know, like they're not, if you read it, the, the um, work of Bennett and Sagerberg, for instance, they are political scientists, and they look at how social media has changed the way uh, young, the youth becomes engaged politically. I think, I mean, there was also this question to a certain extent with them also, and, 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 and you know, like 2011 also as it happened here in, in Spain to a certain extent. 
but it's, it's all a question of, you know, like, is it fluid? Does it mean that somehow people are no longer part of one party, but they may be just part of the campaign? They may just sign up uh, one petition online. You know, like the way people become engaged politically through social media has changed. Now, this was one of the questions that ha I had addressed personally in my own PhD thesis when I looked at how the, the post-revolutionary debate happened in Tunisia and Egypt. And the, um, some of the conclusion, the findings that I came up with was that, so after conducting interviews, analyzing, you know, like uh, large data sets on social media, conducting social network analysis and so on. And, and then I, I came up with this idea that, you know, like along with a lot of, the, so somehow this, also these ideas confirmed what was written in social media, you know, like research. You know, like, okay, there's more symbolism. It's, it's a more vague form of political discourse, okay? But also, um, because it, there's more symbolism, there's less ideological argument, you know? Because, this, you know, you, you, okay, you active on Twitter, it's harder for you to consolidate an ideological argument on Twitter, because it's mostly very short form of, you know, like sentences. So there's more of an illusion of consen consensus, you know? So people follow you on Twitter, but, you know, they might also become confused because there's less space to actually just clearly express what you mean. And that was actually what happened in Tunisia and Egypt because people were talking about freedom, equality, social equality, broad terms that were very vague and hardly, you know, ha could hardly mater materialize, uh, you know, in a strong political discourse. And that's also what led the post-revolutionary youth to be, you know, like also, um, somehow uh, uh, hardly impose themselves, you know, in the post-revolutionary debate. So that's uh, that things that I uh, personally demonstrated in my thesis. So, um, you know, political message, somehow there's a bubble effect, you know, communities remain within each other, they think that everyone think the same, think like them, it's the political message is on demand, you know, like you always end up um, interacting within the same communities. There's a rejection of traditional politics at the same time. You know, people ju are just fed up of parties. They don't want to be part of one specific institution and so on. They're just happy with this fluid way of, you know, becoming engaged politically. And there's a lack of pluralistic and critical debate somehow. That's, that's not my own argument. This is an argument that you find in Patrice Flitch's uh, um, uh, theories, uh, in, uh, in uh, Sherry Turkle's theories and so on. So I'm just, I'll come back to jihadism of course, based on that. But I just want to read this quotation from, you know, the people that I interviewed, like Tunisian and Egyptian people that I interviewed, young people that were part of the revolution and that I met in 2014 and told me about their own frustration of what they, they, they thought they had failed, of why they thought that the revolution had fa uh, failed. Twitter, for example. Because Twitter is so limited, the amount of words you can write in one tweet literally you don't have the space to write something that is comprehensive, that is deep enough to be concrete. It's mostly vague. What else? The bubble effect. You talk with people who are all like-minded, and that's what, uh, that's what people do. You follow only one, pe uh, one people, uh, you, sorry, you follow only people who agree with you. So you are in a big echo room, and so you get the impression that my opinion is, wow, everyone agrees with me, I'm right. And so you get convinced, and. Uh, it makes you blind to the differences. It makes you blind to the fact that you are a minority, actually. Now, about pluralism, another quote. I think that the most important thing that revolutionaries should have learned was basically to make a distinction between an impression and an opinion and the communications message. These are three different things. And the fact that the immediacy of social media has mixed things up. That's a failure, and that's primarily a failure of communication. Now, one last quote. You have access to everyone in terms of social media. But social media, at the end of the day, is a reflection of the societal context. I mean, the societal context was polarized. There was plurality, you can say dichotomy, more than plurality in social media. So you find pages that are endorsing certain forms of fascism and other pages that are endorsing other forms of fascism. And I cannot say it is diversity because diversity works with synergy. It works with cohabitation. So that somehow explains the, the idea of this bubble effect, okay? 
Now, what I would like to argue, I'm not going to read this one because I'm not sure I have enough time. I'm just going to go straight to the next slide. Um, so what I want to argue is basically that this has potentially created a favorable environment for radicalization in the sense that, you know, sh you know shortly after 2011, there was political consciousness. People became aware, you know, after years of censorship that they had different views. But because, you know, there was a response to it that was somehow closer to repression, that the, the, the political debate was polarized. You know, the, the former elites were very much scared of political Islam, regardless of its form, because of course you had Salafi movements that were willing to, be, to take part in politics. You had, you know, like the most traditional, you know, like well-established political, you know, um, uh, Islamist groups, um, and you have like, of course, you have the Muslim Brotherhood and Nahd in Tunisia, in Tunisia, so you have all sorts somehow of is Islamist movements. But also in this polarized environment, what I'd like to argue is that, you know, technology as it as it had set the architecture of the of the public debate, also had an impact, and we should keep this in mind also in the way we think of insurgency groups and radicalization. Of course, they're not part of the political debate because they deny the political debate. They say, people should not be part of the election. They shouldn't take part in a, you know, to democracy and you know, somehow uh, debating and deliberation affects the principle of tafhid and we should impose the caliphate. Yes, they're not part of the political debate. They are on the fringe. But somehow, that the way that they've grown to actually you know, incorporate technologies and so on, it should also be thought in terms of how the entire political sphere has been using social media also, and how social media has affected the entire political debate. Now, um, so to summarize this first idea, I just want to say, so radicali um, radicalized views, um, they tend to refer to uh, they do no, no longer refer to one specific context. That's also what virtual caliphate is so uh, fluid and somehow innovative when it comes to uh, social media. It's about, okay, we're so virtual, we use utopia that is so vague and broad that somehow it, it's likely to be applied anywhere. It can be applied in Iraq, it could be applied in Sinai, it could be applied in Afghanistan, anywhere. So that's the, also this idea, okay? It's very fluid. Um, and there's also this idea that you know, it's a rejection of Rastafarian politics. You know, we, it's not about national identity. We are Muslim. Islam is beyond nationalism. Okay, so there's th this idea. And there's also this idea that Sherry Turkles, um, so she's a sociologist in social media, and she actually looks at social media specifically, and she says, you know, social media somehow, it's, it's a second self. It's like, it, you know, people have a virtual life of their own. They play on World of Warcraft. Do you know what World of Warcraft is? Okay, so they play and they have this avatar. And they, they create a second life for themselves, okay? Because this avatar has its own life and his, its own wife and its own name and its own so on. So it's like a virtual reality of yourself. And she says as a sociologist, you know, like, new generations are a little bit about that. You know, like, they have their virtual life and their real life. And somehow, even if you look at the virtual caliphate and the way that, you know, like for instance, ISIS has been using social media, there's a little bit of that, you know, like young recruits, they use a kunya, which is a kunya, it's a new name that they have when they become proper fighters and recruits of the caliphate. They, they forget their former name, they have a new name, they have their own avatar, they have their own virtual life where they invent their new life for themselves. They dream about death because death is for them, it's another, it opens the door to another like virtual world. So that's also something that has been addressed by Roy and I just wanted to like think about this also in terms of the sociology of the media. Now, in Tunisia, so one of the dangers also of using, you know, uh, I don't know how we're doing with time. No, it's okay. It's okay? So um, <clears throat> in Tunisia, you can see that somehow a lot of the once politicized youth, people that were also very engaged in 2011 and so on, is no longer that much uh, you know, represented in mainstream politics. Uh, there's also this um, 
disillusion and frustration in the thought that, you know, like Marzouki's government and so on somehow need that to uh, represent a form of counter revolution. And there's also a lot of frustration for these young people that, you know, they feel, okay, we tried politics, but, you know, we really don't know. And, you know, there's, you know, the counter revolution is too strong. And they turn to more informal forms of politics. Uh, that's for the middle class or like the youth that somehow had still access to higher education. But if you look at the disenfranchised youth that is really facing a lot of employment, um, then, you know, of course it becomes a more, a more, a stronger form of revolt. And this is like the disenfranchised youth typically in Tunisia that has become um, vulnerable to the discourse of radical organizations such as Ansara Sharia in Tunisia, and also potentially the reason why there are so many Tunisian recruits that um, have, um, in, that engaged in Daesh, in uh, the Islamic, the so-called Islamic State. So um, what I'd like to argue with that is that somehow, you know, engaging the, the youth back into the mainstream politics is also one way to, you know, um, prevent the, you know, like the, the, the alienation, political alienation of the youth uh, as it happens in, in the Middle East. Uh, and and so, so that somehow the youth doesn't feel that much, is not becoming so much at, at risk of being radicalized. That, that is one way to look at it. But alternatively, and I will come back to this argument, I think that what I would argue is that political agencies tend to actually engage in media jihad. And what I mean that by this, not in media jihad, sorry, in information warfare, they engage in information warfare in the sense that as a response to propaganda, they end up developing their own competing media narratives. And that, that's something that is actually a proper counter-radicalization strategy that is called counter-narratives. And it's debated, uh, you know, like amongst experts, you know, like whether or not this countering narratives approach is successful or not. But I'm quite critical of that, and I just want to discuss this with you today. So I'm, I'm just going to uh, skip very quickly on this. So you have, um, you know, radicalization is a very uh, controversial topic, right? Because of course, the way it's used to justify some form of foreign policy in the Middle East and so on. Also because it relates to a lot of different parameters, you know, like this sociology, you know, like people have socioeconomic grievances, they want to express it. Is it the reason why they become radical? Is it because of, you know, the uh, criminal past? Is it because of, you know, like uh, politics? What is the role of political Islam when it comes to, you know, like jihadism more specifically and so on? So in a way, um, this I'm going to skip very quickly on this because you, I don't want you to pay too much at attention to this. So it's, there are a lot of different parameters, right? This is only for the few of you who like math. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So, um, so, you know, there are different parameters. And this is, a, you know, like we could, we could go on forever adding parameters, adding potential variables to this equation. Okay, because obviously we don't know, you know, like, is it more or less political Islam? You know, does political Islam work as an alternative to radicalization or does it actually increase radicalization? But still, you know, just we could, we could go on. Uh, you know, like, is it, is it crime? Is, is it, you know, the identity crisis and so on? And what is the overall, you know, like factor behind this? Now, I, I already talked about the youth, right? Acting, uh, you know, like trying to engage the youth back in, in mainstream politics. The alienation of the youth is potentially a push factor of radicalization. Is it, is it the main, you know, like issue that, that, poli that uh, political agencies should focus on and so on? I address that. Now, how do, you know, how do state, you know, like, um, tech companies and so on, governments and so on, engage in a form of information warfare, whether it is willingly or unwillingly. Um, so I, I'd say that it's also about how they produce competing media narratives and how they position themselves uh, uh, <coughs> with regards to, you know, like, towards the public, you know, when, when it comes to actually justify their approach, you know, whether it is foreign policy or how they condemn um, 
radicalization. It's also about how they portray it in the media and how they portray it in their own policy responses to, to terrorism and so on. So there's, they want to, some, some state happen to also gain legitimacy from <coughs> responding to terrorism. And it has been the case, for instance, you know, the whole debate between you know, Qatar and Saudi Arabia with you know, the Saudi-led boycott of Qatar, uh, which was also a result of the, you know, like the pressure that Gulf countries wanted to exercise on Qatar, for instance, with Al Jazeera, you know, like the media channel, playing a big part in the le new landscape of the Middle East, potentially promoting political Islam, and so on. This somehow also, you know, um, uh, it somehow leads to different, to a, to a very, uh, you know, an environment of uncertainty in the Middle East. Because as they see, you know, like as, you know, like people consume so different form of media that position themselves differently, you know, that support different political actors across the Middle East, it creates, you know, like, uh, so competing, constant uh, environment for competing narratives in, and the way that uh, different issues relating to radicalization are addressed in the Middle East um, are framed totally differently depending on the perspective. And what I would like to argue is that this also increased polarization and this also somehow creates a favorable environment for conspiracy theories, for instance. So I'm just gonna comment on a study that we conducted to exemplify this argument, uh, where we looked at di two different media. We looked at Al Jazeera, uh, which is a Qatari news channel that you've probably all heard of, and we compared it with Al Arabiya, uh, which is the, somehow a Saudi um, uh, rural uh, channel. And um, so, so as you can see, so Al Jazeera is Qatari state-funded. Uh, it's an alternative perspective. So it, it actually portrays itself as you know, like offering an alternative perspective somehow less biased, that's, what they, that's how they promote themselves. Um, but it's also considered as a platform for dissidents across the region, mostly the ones that would be more you know, in line with political Islam. <coughs> On the other hand, the Saudi channel Al Arabiya also promotes itself as, you know, like, you know, uh, you, you know it, it's like emphasizes this message of fighting radical politics fighting political Islam as a form of radical politics. Um, and it has been criticized uh, for being you know, a tool for, um, for um, soft power from the Saudi government in the region. It would also potentially be uh, being quite biased when it came to uh, uh, covering the um, you know, Shia, Sunni issues across the region. So the two, so you look, we look at Qatar and Saudi Arabia <laughs> that are in this case, clearly fighting, uh, they, they are clearly engaging in a form of media war, right? Because they are uh, together uh, investing a lot of resources in being present in the media landscape of the region with different argument and different way to frame the news, okay? So now, of course, it's also about how they portray themselves as engaging in the war or not engaging, however you understand it, in the war against terrorism, right? But it's also the way that, you know, like, the way that they engage somehow in this kind of, in the whole issue of media, and you know, like how, how people are going to somehow buy into their own approach to the media narratives around the Syrian crisis and so on. So, for instance, we looked at more specifically, like, I'm <coughs> quickly still, do I still have some time? Yeah. Okay. Couple, yeah, I don't know how much we should have for Q&A, maybe? Yeah, I think if we have 10 more minutes of your speech, then we'll have yeah. like half an hour. Good. Okay, so um, I'll be very quick. This is only about, um, this is only to tell you some, uh, how we looked at the data set for this particular study. We focused more specifically on how these two channels put, uh, covered US foreign policy in the Middle East. So for instance, how U.S. Uh, presidential campaign was uh, covered by these media. As you know, Trump's campaign was very controversial, uh, also in regards to, um, you know, like his, uh, um, the way he uh, promoted his own uh, views on foreign policy and, and, and terrorism. Um, also the way that he referred to Islam during the presidential campaign. 
we looked at the um, uh, ban uh, executive order, the travel ban executive order, because um, you might have followed uh, this over the last uh, year, when actually um, seven countries, including uh, Iran, uh, Iraq, uh, Somalia, and so on, were actually banned uh, to travel in the US, with a review of this particular law uh, excluding Iraq uh, uh, from the list, though it was a, a Shia majority country and so on. So these are all kind of media events that are relevant to the way that Qatar and Saudi Arabia position themselves, not only in terms of what's going on in the Levant, but also in terms of how they, how they promote the aliens or non-aliens with the US and so on, and with the West and so on. So that's, that's an interesting, uh, that, that's basically the reason why we focus on this particular media uh, event. So um, what we found from this was that the two media tend to have distinctive approaches in terms of media framing. They don't, would, they would cover one specific, they would cover the events, but from different perspective. They would focus on one aspect of the event. They would rely on different sources, for instance, Al Jazeera um, tends to include less sources from the American press or officials and so on, whereas the Saudi channel Al Arabiya tends to use much more, um, uh, you know, like experts, quote experts from the U.S. literature and so on. Um, and they also tend to convey, as I mentioned, different images of the U.S. and also different images of the West. Uh, they have, they appear to have, you know, like. Um, because we looked at also readers' comment, and we, look at, we looked at how people responded to the news. And based on that, it was also very interesting to notice that you know, the reaction of the people, whether they were reading Al Jazeera or uh, 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 Al Arabiya, were equally polarized. And you find people that are pro-Assad, that post comments on, on, on the news channel, people that are extremely um, opposing, you know, like uh, uh, Assad, um, uh, in Syria and so on. So um, you, we can see how polarized the debate is, uh, regardless of how this, um, um, regard, I mean, regardless of what uh, uh, platform it is, whether it is Al Jazeera or Al Arabiya, the debate remains polarized. Um, and so that also leads to question how this war over media and this global war over media narratives might somehow affect, increase, or you know, like impact on potential push factors of radicalization, such as you know, like the polarization of the debate, the engagement of the youth in mainstream politics, and so on. Um, so I think that brings me to my conclusion. Uh, as I said, I just think that when we look at propaganda, we should not only be looking at propaganda as it's being designed by insurgency groups, but also at how governments are responding to it, how this propaganda, propaganda is being covered in the mainstream media, and the dialectic between the two. So that's basically my argument for today. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, I think, ah, oh, sorry. I think you really tackled many issues, and I found my, I think, I hope my students have been able to relate some of the issues we discussed uh, last, uh, last Tuesday, and we will discuss next Tuesday as well, some of these social media uh, effects uh, during and after the, the so-called Arab uh, revolts. Uh, so now it's time for Q&A, so it's time for questions, answers. Uh, I think you raised uh, quite a lot of, of, of issues here, and I don't know if you want to start, otherwise I will start, and you will not be able to stop me anymore. <laughs> so this is a threat, <laughs> it's a direct threat. So I don't know if anyone wants to start. You will have to raise your voices because we don't have micro today. Yes. So it's more of a side question because I'm not really an ISIS expert. We had one, on one of the slides that the revenues were going down. So my question is, where are the revenues coming from? Yeah. Uh, so um, 
uh, the main part of the revenues, so this is uh, data that I got from experts on this particular uh, question, because I, I am myself, I'm only looking at propaganda, and I, I, um, I'm not that much of an expert on you know, the financial uh, side of, of the organization. But mostly the revenue, um, as they came in, um, initially in 20, uh, 2015, 2014, 2015, was, it was uh, from tax, so um, uh, collected from within the territories occu occupied by ISIS, uh, and oil uh, through intermediaries um, sold uh, presumably to, to the regime, to the Assad regime, but through intermediaries, as I said, yes. Yes. Uh, no, I think uh, clearly there was less um, awareness of what was going on in terms of the um, of the um, uh, virtual jihad, so to speak. Um, I think, uh, honestly, I don't know. I'm not exactly sure why. I think uh, simply because maybe there was there's more of a culture of censorship in those countries, so somehow um, you know, uh, I think there's there's less of a there was less of a um, um, actually a, a critical debate on whether or not th this should be shown and, and, and people were less aware. I think people are like significantly less aware of, of how uh, insurgency groups are present, you know, like in the media. I mean, uh, apart from those who actually consume this type of propaganda, you know, like the fringe of the population that is actually, you know, like <coughs> um, supporting or, you know, like interested in this type of activism. So, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, that, that, well, that was mostly uh, uh, some, I think, a debate that was occurring in, in, in Europe and the West. But I think it's also, sorry, no, I no, just no. want to add, that's also because simply, um, I think from a Western perspective, we are perceiving it more as the key issue to, you know, like lone wolf actors and foreign fighters, you know, like traveling to conflict zone. Uh, <coughs> Whereas, you know, if you, if you actually ask Egyptians, you know, like, where the threat of radicalization comes from, they would say Sinai, you know? So, so it's actually, it has more of a, uh, like, local kind of, yeah, it's, it's located somewhere, somehow, <laughs> beyond social media. Yes? Yes? Um, I think, I mean, honestly, I think it's more a question of, um, it's, again, I think it's renewing the, the entire debate on, you know, how far does, uh, you know, like, um, the right to privacy actually goes when it comes to encrypted channels and encrypted platforms. Um, and then, you know, I know of some experts on radicalization uh, that, you know, would say, would argue actually that somehow, as long as it's, uh, restricted to, because there's, there's a lot of surveillance being done, regardless of what's going on in terms of censorship, you know, that, you know, somehow as long as it's restricted to, to, to um, encrypted platforms, such as Telegram is, is still manageable somehow, and it's not, um, that, that the real threat was as long as the organizations were visible uh, considerably on mainstream social platforms. Now, I'm not sure I would agree with, with that. Um, and also the real question is also how, you know, like to what extent do encrypted, you know, like platforms such as Telegram also benefit from this type of um, activities? Um, but yeah, I mean, that's an ongoing debate. Yes, there was another question. Yes. Yeah. Um, until now, okay, the military strategy has made the so-called uh, 
in the States and I think in Poland and, and so on. But I think that the, the problem of radicalization is still important and alarming. And, and how can we fight it here in, in Europe? And it, maybe the battle ground between the education system and the European policies. Um, yeah, of course. Um, so I really think that the um, so as it happens in in Europe, uh, as we understand it in Europe, radicalization uh, is is um, a totally different process from from how it's going on, wh what is going on actually in the MENA region, and that's also the reason why I gave the examples of these two media. You know, like the way you know propaganda is framed for you know like the MENA region uh, as opposed to you know, like transnational audience. So I think that, the, you know, there are different parameters. There's a question of how um, Islam, um, um, of course, there's a question of how Islam is addressed in relation to national identity across Europe, to what extent, you know, like, uh, do Muslim communities really suffer from grounded um, socioeconomic you know, like, are their socioeconomic grievances somehow relevant, you know, like, depending on the different European countries? And these are still questions that we should ask ourselves in the European context. Um, but of course, they just be entirely distinguished from what's going on uh, elsewhere. Um, now, now, European scholars, when they've been addressing this issue, they've also somehow positioned themselves with regards to, you know, like, the political Islam question. You know, and that's also part of the division between Kepel and Roy. It's about, you know, like, um, uh, you know, whereas Olivier Roy would say, you know, like, okay, um, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with political Islam. It ha actually doesn't have anything to do with Islam. And, and Kepel being more kind of cautious with, you know, like condemning somehow the role that political Islam had. Um, I think that, you know, if we look at Europe specifically, we should have, we should really like try to abstract ourselves from the debate on political